Hallelujah. Here we are again in session six of the New Creation Teaching Series. And I entitled this session, The Reign of Grace. And if you remember in the last session, uh, the session five, we discussed about two important and powerful things from the gospel. The fact that we die, the believer in the new creation in Christ has died to the sin nature and to the sinful flesh from the inner man, from the spirit man, once and for all. And he died, the, uh, every believer in new creation uh, dies once at the moment of salvation dies to sin to sin as nature and then from there on every day the believer enforces and proclaims that death into the soul into the mind into the body and on the outside world and uh, today we are going to discuss again powerful and exciting things and if in the last session we said that we, uh, we no longer have a sinful flesh, the power of the sinful flesh is gone, the natural question probably that you may wonder next is why, what are the major reasons for the believer to keep sinning or performing sinful actions after salvation? Why do we still sin after salvation? Why do we still uh, do sin, perform sinful actions after salvation? Uh, and this is the first thing that we are going to discuss today and study. The second thing is what are the negative, the major negative effects of the sinful actions in our life, especially those ones that we repeat on and on and we don't seem to have significant victory over, over those actions, those habits or addictions. And thirdly, uh, we'll talk about the solution, how to get rid of those sinful actions, how to grow in holiness, how to uh, live that life of righteousness that God has given us effortlessly and, and how to walk every day in it. Are you excited to, to learn about this? And uh, even from the start, I, if you remember in the last session, during the session, I mentioned somewhere that after salvation, you can do whatever you want. And some of you may have been taken um, for, uh, by that statement or uh, scared by that statement. I want to say in this session that I am against sin and God is against sin. But in the same time, um, the Christian and the believer and the new creation has real freedom to, to live righteous for God. That doesn't mean that we need to sin. And I'll explain more in detail in the next session probably, and probably a little bit here in the section, uh, session six. Uh, but I just wanted to clarify that, that by my teaching and by what I explain here, I don't want to give license to sin, and I don't think I will, because if we understand it correctly, there is no license to sin. And we will see, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will give us revelation and will show us how to work out our salvation. Uh, so if you're ready, let's begin for, with the first question that I said, what are the major reasons? There are many reasons, but what do I think are uh, some important reasons? Why do we still keep sinning after salvation, after we died to sin and to the sinful flesh? And the first reason is that the preconditioning. Uh, we have been conditioned ever since we, we were born in this world. We were born with a sinful nature before we were saved and before we came into Christ. So because of that sinful nature, our minds, our souls, and our bodies have been conditioned to sin. And not only by the sinful nature, but also by the world, by the sinful environment around us, by the fallen world around us, and also by the devil. Our minds have been trained and conditioned to sin. And that's the first reason. The second reason is a lack of understanding, accurate understanding and teaching and revelation of the gospel and what to believe in and how to believe in. And we are going to talk about that. And the third reason is once you get that understanding, once you get revelation on what to believe, how to believe, how to walk, uh, how to live this life of faith and holiness, then we need uh, the third reason is a lack of faith. We need to put faith into that revelation and teaching consistently and persevere into it uh, until Christ is formed in us, until that teaching, until that the gospel is established in us, is strengthened in us, and we are established. The Bible uh, talks about being established in Christ. Not it's not necessary. It's not enough just to come into Christ, but you need to be established and strengthened into Christ. And Paul says. I, uh, that he groans uh, until Christ is formed in us. In, in, the, in uh, one of the churches in the New Testament, Christ needs to be formed in us. The conditioning of the mind needs to be overwritten by the renewal of the mind of what uh, Christ is and what we have become in Christ. Uh, then we need to get 
uh, a good understanding of the gospel by teaching, by listening to sermons, by listening to the Holy Spirit, by our devotional time, and then put faith in what we understood, in what we received from the Lord, and the revelation that we received. We're moving to the second thing, uh, the second point of this session, where I want to discuss about the, a few negative effects of the sinful actions that we do in our lives, especially those that we repeat, uh, like addictions or habits that we repeat on and on. And the first negative effect of our sinful action, I'm talking about this because I want you to be aware of what's happening with you and uh, how the devil tried to lie to us and how he tried to, he tried to keep us in bondage to sin. And when you know about this, you will know how to fight. You know how to be victorious. And the first uh, negative effect that what happens with us when we sin is that it makes us feel that we still have a sinful nature inside of us, which we cannot control most of the times. And that is not true you will feel that you are still a sinner and the, that you have something inside that you cannot control. You have victory one day and the second you don't and you don't seem to have the upper hand and see consistent victory and that uh, lies to your mind that you still have an evil principle in you and a sinful nature and that is not true. And I want to destroy that lie even and now to destroy it and believe that you are, are no longer a sinner. You are a saint in your spirit. You are a saint. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and, uh, and you are free of condemnation. The second negative thing that happens when we sin is that it makes us wonder if we were genuinely saved in the first place and maybe you will do the, the sinner's prayer again and again, or you'll be baptized in water again, just to make sure that you're safe. And also you will begin to doubt or begin to think that you might have lost your salvation because you kept sinning and sinning. And how long will God forgive us? How long will God uh, bear with us? And you'll have that feeling of doubt and that feeling that uh, will create in you a guilt condemnation that will set you up to sin more and more and you will try to be more righteous you will try to to make more resolutions and try to do more works of holiness and that will set you up to sin even more so that's another strategy of the devil when you sin that's what he does to our mind he plays with our mind and i want to tell you here if you were if you were if you were honest you if you were sincere when you received christ into your heart you are saved forever. You did, not, you did not lose your salvation and you will never lose it because of your work. Because your salvation is not based on your works after salvation. It's not based on your works before salvation. It's never based, it's never maintained by your works. It's complete, it's totally based on Christ's righteousness and is maintained by Christ's righteousness. The deeds and the works of righteousness that you do after salvation, you do for reward, not to maintain your salvation. And I want to destroy that lie. And I will talk more in detail about the gift of no condemnation in the next session and how powerful that is, that you are justified forever and nothing and no one can separate you from the love of the Father. Not your sin, not a person, not even yourself. Nobody can separate you from the love of the Father. I said in the previous session, death has no, has no master over you anymore in Christ Jesus. You will never be able to experience again spiritual death because you are in Christ and Christ lives forever. Uh, and the third thing that happens when we sin, it kills our boldness and our confidence in destroying the works of darkness. In other words, it kills your faith. If you, if you did something sinful, when you are faced with a sick person, it will be very hard for you to pray for that sick person. You, you will notice that your boldness and your faith is less, is smaller because uh, the devil will remind you what you did that day or the previous day or that week if it's fresh. And also uh, when you try to do any, any act of ministry, any, any work of ministry, praying for people, teaching, preaching, uh, leading worship, anything like ministering to the poor, you will see that those sins will, will attack your mind and will kill your confidence, your joy, you will take up your joy. And that, that is what we don't want because that's another strategy of the devil. By the sinful action, he will kill your joy. And uh, I want to destroy all this and to make you aware that no matter what happens, even if you do sinful actions, that doesn't change your position with God. That doesn't change your status in your vital state. Amen. And now we're moving on to the solution. 
and probably you are waiting for that. How do we get rid of sinful actions and habits? How do we grow in holiness? How do we live this life of God? And if you're ready and if you have a Bible with you, let's open uh, at Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 and let's read it together. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. I want you to notice in verse 9, second verse of this passage, that says, "Is not the, our salvation is not the result of works, so that no one, it's by grace through faith. You are not saved by your works, your salvation is not worked out and manifested through your works by trying to do works. Although salvation manifests itself through works and we, we do works of righteousness, but you do not work it out by doing, uh, by doing the do's, uh, do's and don'ts. We will see how you do it. And your salvation is not maintained through your works. Amen? And I, I read this passage because we walk in holiness and we are sanctified in exactly the same way we have been saved initially, by grace through faith and by the confession of our mouth. There is no other solution, by grace through faith. And we are sanctified in our minds, in our bodies, in the same way we are initially saved. And the, uh, I want to say if, uh, one thing about grace. Grace is not only mercy or something that uh, the fa unmerited favor. Grace is a power, is the power of God for salvation, for sanctification, for healing the sick. For is the it's it's a grace, it's the power. We see, grace is the power, and faith is the channel for that power to flow in our lives. So grace, the grace of God is the power of God, and faith. The faith is the channel through which the grace is released and flows in our lives, bringing us salvation in every area of our life. We see that Stephen in Acts, Stephen was full of grace and power. He wasn't full of mercy, he was full of grace, the power, the ability of God. And then we see somewhere else in the epistle that grace can be multiplied, grace and peace be multiplied. So grace is not just mercy, it's not, although it includes that, mercy, grace is a power, is the power of God that works sanctification and causes us to work in holiness. So grace is the power that cause us to uh, be sanctified and walk in holiness. And that grace is released in our lives through faith. And we will see the right believing will produce right living. When you believe right, you believe what you need to believe from the word of God and you have faith in what you need to have faith, then you will see right living. Let's move on to Romans 10, 17 to see how does, if grace is the power that we need so that we will walk in holiness, then we need to find out how to build the channel for grace to flow, faith. And Romans 10, 17 says this, Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So faith comes from hearing the word of Christ, of what Christ or who Christ is and who you are in Christ, the word of Christ, the word of grace, the word of righteousness. You see all these definitions when you read in the New Testament, uh, in, the, in the epistles, in the apostle, James, Peter, Hebrews, uh, all the Pauline epistles, you see different namings uh, of the word of Christ. So when you hear the word, there's no other way for you to be built up in faith. I mean, there's praying in tongues and praying in the Spirit, but the, the major way you, where you grow in understanding, I was talking about the lack of understanding, lack of teaching, lack of revelation, is by hearing the Word, the Rema of Christ, meditating on the Word, hearing sermons, reading the Word, uh, exposing yourself, immersing yourself in the Word of righteousness, in the Word of grace. That will bring faith into your spirit. And then you build that faith by prayer, prayer in the spirit. Jude uh, 120 says, build yourself up in faith by praying in the spirit. But faith comes from hearing the word of Christ. So I will explain uh, what is this word of Christ. And I will describe uh, four subtle and unconscious lies in regards to sinful actions that we have, we may have in our minds. And I want us, I want us to destroy. This is a part of of hearing the word of Christ, of hearing uh, the, the word of Christ and building faith into you. There are four, I found out four major lies that may be 
in your mind and in your heart in regards to sinful actions. The first lie uh, that comes to us, that is very subtle there in our mind, is that you cannot do it. You cannot really walk in holiness. You cannot change yourself yourself and it's too difficult for you to change it's too difficult for me to change and you have that feeling of uh, helplessness and you feel like I cannot stop from gossiping I cannot stop from getting angry or from saying bad words I cannot stop from lusting for other women uh, in my mind or from smoking or from drinking or from taking drugs and you feel overwhelmed you feel like you cannot do it everybody says you can do it the Bible says you can do it but you feel the other way around that you cannot do it and I want to say that is a lie from the pit of hell that is a lie from the devil the bible says that you can the new creation in christ jesus the believer can change can live without sin the believer is more than an overcomer more than a conqueror greater is christ who is in the believer than he that is in the world and philippians 4 13 says the truth of god this is the word of christ now we replace we renew our mind we take a lie and we replace it with the word of god we take it out of our minds philippians 4 13 says i can do all things through him who strengthens me through christ who strengthens me when you come in christ Christ is your strength and you can do anything, you can do all things, anything by the power of Christ, by the power of grace. That lie that you cannot do it, that has been lingering there for years, take it off right now, put it down. You can and not you but the grace that is in you, the power of the Holy Spirit that is in you and we will see how. 1 Corinthians 10 13 says this, no temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to men. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Either He will uh, help you avoid the temptation and not enter the temptation. If you remember Jesus in the Gethsemane Garden told, told the disciple, pray so that you will not enter temptation. So sometimes you don't need to enter a temptation, but if you enter it, be sure that in the middle of temptation, God has prepared the way for you to escape or endure it. To escape from it or endure it. It, it. it doesn't matter because the grace of God can help you escape or endure it. But either way, you can be victorious. You can be conqueror in every temptation, in every situation. And I want you to destroy that lie from your mind, from your soul, from your spirit. And, um, and uh, I want you to be free by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to give an example about uh, uh, the so-called the elephant syndrome, and uh, it, which reveals this conditioning of the mind that you've been, you've been lied to that you cannot. The uh, mature elephants, they are very big and they can, they can destroy trees, they can take out houses, they, can, they are very big. But when they are little, when they are born and they are in captivity, uh, because they have this in their nature to roam freely, they are usually uh, bound, usually bound to a, to a tree with a rope. And while they are little, uh, they try with everything they have while they are bound with that rope to the tree, they try to escape, they try to roam free. And after a while, after they do all their efforts, they discover that they cannot escape from that rope, from that tree. They don't have the necessary strength to escape and they give up. And the thing is that when they grow to maturity, they become able to escape from that rope, from that bondage. But because they tried so many times, they failed so many times, their mind becomes conditioned that they cannot do it. And they really believe it and they will never try to escape from there. And the same way, we, the same way we are people before salvation, we are conditioned that we, and we, before salvation, we really couldn't, couldn't be overcomers. We really couldn't overcome sin consistently. And we didn't have the ability, the power, we didn't have the grace. We had a sin nature. But after salvation, 
that sin nature is gone that rope is gone you can be free you can do it by the grace of God you can live holy you can conquer sin you can conquer addictions and that's a good news you just need to believe it and destroy that lie in the beginning it will be a little hard because you are used with that condition with that lie but the but as you start proclaiming as you start meditating on that and destroying that lie it will become easier and you'll see you'll be more free and free you'll experience more freedom um, and the secret the secret uh, here you can but the secret is not to fight directly with the sinful action and habits in the form of do's and those or resolution you don't need to fight even with the devil the bible never says fight the devil the bible doesn't say fight fight with your addictions with your habits and try not to do, try hard not to do it the secret is your fight the bible says is to remain in faith your fight is the fight of faith not fight with uh, with sin with sinful actions it's the fight of faith in in the grace of god is the fight of rest you need to fight to rest and have faith that grace will do its supernatural work in you effortlessly in first timothy 6 12 paul says this fight the good fight of faith take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses you need to fight and trust that the grace of god will do his work of holiness of sanctification in you effortlessly and one more thing a very important thing you don't struggle to have faith in your faith you don't put your faith in your faith so many times i wonder do i have enough faith to do this how do i grow my faith you don't put your faith in your faith and neither you put your faith in your prayer you may want you may pray many hours or pray in tongues or pray in different ways and you may uh, at a certain point you may begin to trust in your prayer time and the, your quality of uh, the quality of your prayer time the length of your prayer time and that is wrong you don't put your faith in prayer you don't put your faith for sanctification or for anything in your fasting time or in your your devotion time how much you have uh, read from the bible your faith is in the grace of god all those things all those disciplines the prayer the the devotion time the fasting all those help you to build your faith to stay in faith to stay rested to stay in the grace to believe in the grace of god that's the that's the their major reason to keep you in faith in the grace that is in you in christ jesus and in the holy spirit and these are tools to refresh and strengthen your faith in the grace of christ and it's not about how big is your faith but how big is the god in which you put your faith into the Bible says in Matthew 17, 20, that the, uh, Jesus says that if you have faith the, as the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this money, move from there to from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. So it's, it's not the size of your faith, but the size of the God in which you put your faith in, the size of the grace in which you put your faith into. Uh, amen. That's the first lie the first lie that you cannot do it but you can the second lie that comes to your mind when you're faced with your addictions with your sins with the things that you do over and over is that i will always have to fight this sin this habit and sooner or later i will fail again i want to tell you no it's not true you will not have to fight all your life for that with that habit with that attitude with that with those words with those uh, behaviors you will not have to fight all your life remember the example with the communism once the power of communism was down people were free to come out of communism and take out the communism out of their mindset out of their attitude out of their lives so once see, the sin nature is gone as we discussed in the last session once sinful flesh is gone you are free to live for god and you are free to take out of you all those sinful habits all those sinful, and it's easy you're no longer a slave to sin it's just there are some remainings in your mind it's just a conditioning of your mind and your body that you can easily change by the power of grace and the third lie is that you feel like if you live for god you might miss some pleasures or things of value uh, that come from sin 
you might feel that you miss something, you miss some pleasure, you love some stuff, that you, you like some things that you want to do, but, be, but God considers them sinful, and then you feel like you miss something. For instance, if you don't go to that, to, that, to that party, or if you don't conform to your friends and you don't listen to your friends, or if you don't smoke or take drugs, or if I keep myself pure for sex intercourse with only one woman uh, in, in marriage, I, am, I will be missing something. I will be missing a lot. No, you don't. You won't. God is way smarter than people and God is way smarter than the devil. And the Bible says in John 10.10 10, that He came that we may have life and have it abundantly. That we may have joy and have it abundantly. May have peace, joy, righteousness and have life and enjoy life. So God is a good God. He wants he wants you to experience life to the full. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to enjoy things, but in, a, in His ways, and his, and his ways are perfect. His wisdom is perfect. You, it may seem that what people offer, what people say, what the world says, what the culture you live in says, that everything is relative, that pleasure is relative, there's no absolute truth, there is no absolute standard. That's not true. God is wisdom. God is, is the, is absolute wisdom. And he, when he decreed certain things, where he knew what he did. And God is such a good God. So don't allow that lie that you're missing something. If you don't go to that party, if you don't do that thing, uh, what will people say? People will laugh at you. They will consider you, uh, um, alone, a weird person, a strange person. Don't receive those lives. And what if? The God, stay with God. Joseph, Joseph, when he was in Egypt, he refused the pleasures for a moment with that wife, the wife of Potiphar. And he went to jail for that for almost 11 or 10, 11, 10, 11 years, if I'm not mistaken. He preferred to endure that and to stay with God. And in the end, he became the king of Egypt. He became the prince of Egypt. And God rewarded what he did when the, 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 the fact that he stayed in righteousness and he did not give in, give in to the short-term pleasures of sin. So I encourage you, take out that lie and destroy that lie. You are not missing anything. You will enjoy life even more to the full. The fourth lie is that everybody does it. So why should I change? It's something normal. It's something that everybody does it. No, for Christians, normality is not defined by the world or by the friends or by the culture that you live in, but by the word of God. And what if everybody does it? You don't need to do it. What if your relatives or your friends or uh, your, your colleagues do it? and do all kinds of sinful things that they might take easy, take it easy and not, not consider them sinful. The fact that everybody does it, it doesn't mean that it's normal and doesn't mean that it's holy. And I want to encourage you to destroy that lie. Don't let that thing compel you to go with the pack, to go with the world, to go with the, uh, but go against the current, go against the, the sinful way of the world. So these were four lies that I wanted to describe. The first that you cannot do it, but you can, that you will always have to fight at the same intensity and the same sinful things, and you will sometimes be victorious, sometimes not. The third, that if you live for God, you might miss something. And the fourth, that everybody does it and it's normal. I hope that that will give you some strength. And these, these were a few things to build your faith and to, to allow the grace of God even more to flow uh, freely in your life. And now let's, let's see more, a little bit more about the grace, this grace of God. Let's read Romans 6, 14 together. Here it says, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. You see, this, this verse says clearly that sin has lost its dominion because after salvation, we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace. And I want to explain in the next few minutes what, what does it mean to be under the law? What does it mean to be under grace? And what was the purpose of the law? So that we, so that we understand what does it mean that you are under grace and why sin does not, sin as nature does not have dominion over you, meaning it does not have master over you, meaning that it uh, you can say no and doesn't have to produce in you sinful action to produce death 
as you did before salvation. So first of all, let's see what does it mean being under the law. And if you are familiar with, a little bit with the Bible, you know that there were two types, mainly two types of law, the moral law and the ceremonial law. And the moral law, the people of Israel, the Jews, they had to obey that moral law in order for them to be righteous, to gain righteousness, and also to have access to the blessings of God. The moral law, the Ten Commandments, they had to be obeyed so that people would have a, a favor with God and have access to the blessings of God. And in order to do that, they had to learn the law by heart and try to obey it. So that was the target, the moral law, uh, to be righteous. Then the means, there were three things, the, the target, the means, and the, what happens when they, uh, bro they broke the law. So the moral law is the target, the, the thing that God called them to do, the means to fulfill the law, to obey the law, was pure human efforts, which were a complete failure. Why? Because of the sin nature inside people. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 56 says that the power of sin is the law. The law aroused the sinful nature in us and fueled that sinful nature so that it would produce more sinful actions and death. So the means were pure human efforts and they fail. And when they fail, the ceremonial law came into play. Whenever the people broke the law, they had the ceremonial law of sacrifices and offerings, atonement every year, so that they would be brought back to a state of blessing. So the people were blessed either by fulfilling, obeying the law, or if they didn't fulfill it, God provided a way for them through the sacrifices to come back to a state of favor with God and to a state of blessing. That was, uh, in a few words, what meant to be under the law. What meant being under the law is that people tried to fulfill the law to be righteous, but they couldn't. They, were, they, didn't, they weren't capable, they didn't have the ability because they had the sin nature. Now being under grace, when you are under grace, people that are under grace are already righteous and have access to all the blessings of God without doing anything because of Christ's righteousness that He won and gained on the earth. He fulfilled the law. He, he gained righteousness. So people that are under grace, they don't try to be righteous. They are righteous before doing anything. They are justified forever they are the righteousness of god in christ jesus and people are these people the believers the new creation are called to walk in holiness and the righteousness of god and do works of righteousness but not to be righteous people under grace do works of righteousness because they are righteousness and not to be righteous or to gain god's favor we are already favored we are already blessed and they don't have to learn the, we don't have to learn the law or try to obey it or try to be conscious of it. We don't need to think about the law because we are already righteous. And in the process of sanctification, it's important. We don't need to be conscious of the law. We don't need to learn the law or try to the do's and don'ts and try different resolutions, different methods, different strategies so that we would do the works of righteousness, of the works of the law. So we are already righteous. We don't try to do something to become righteous under grace. The means to holiness under grace is faith in the grace power of God that He will cause people to walk in the righteousness. You don't even need, as I said, to be conscious of the law or try to obey it with the new creation ability, new creation ability inside. You know, some people, uh, even I, I was included, I thought like I have become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not under the law, but I'm above the law in the sense that now I can. I have the ability to fulfill the law by, by the new birth. And that is not accurate either. You, even if you are rebirthed, you have the new creation life in you. You have the grace of God. You have the Holy Spirit. You don't try using that power. You don't try yourself to fulfill the law to be holy. You just believe and have faith, put your faith that the grace, that, and we'll see a few verses, that God is the one working in you holiness. God will cause you to work in, to, to walk in His statutes, in His laws, in His righteousness. Just believe that Christ will live 
uh, will live it f- uh, will live through you and he will change the whatever needs to be changed whenever you put your faith in the grace of Christ he will change the processes of your mind he will or maybe he will make you avoid some temptations or when you come to that temptation or desire or maybe he will cut off completely any desire to sin or to do certain things sinful things that you used to do or will help you to endure it or to escape it but his grace will lead you will cause you will make you effortlessly when you trust in his grace he will live for you because you no longer live but christ lives in you you just need to believe and make that switch in your mind and i no longer live but christ lives in me and trust in that power that that power will lead you that power will cause you to walk to live in righteousness and third if we keep the same the same three things from the being under law the third whenever believers still do sinful actions there is the eternal sacrifice of jesus that replaced the ceremonial law of moses those repeated sacrifices for sins uh, and the the sacrifice for atonement they were replaced by the eternal once and for all sacrifice of jesus at the cross and this sacrifice removes those sins automatically they are removed they are already paid for whatever you sin they are already covered so you are blessed either way you are blessed first when you when you are saved you are blessed forever and if you sin or still do sinful actions the sacrifice of jesus ensures that you keep keep being blessed you are you keep being blessed forever so that is what means being under grace grace controls you grace leads you but only when you believe it when you believe in it you will not take full advantage of the grace if you try to do it yourself even as a new creation if you try different strategies different things different thoughts oh when i'm faced with this i need to think this way i need to encourage myself i need to no you need to believe completely and let it go believe that god is faithful and he will work in you righteousness and now the purpose of the law is described in romans in very few words in romans 3 20 why was the law given if the law couldn't produce righteousness couldn't produce life Uh, romans 3 20 says paul says because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for through the law comes the knowledge of sins so the law came to bring knowledge of sin in other words to show people that they are sinful and they need salvation that was one of the purposes of the law and the second uh, as I, uh, the first part of the verse says that by the works of the law which are holy the works of the law the law is spiritual so the works of the law are spiritual but by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight that shows us that the law the second reason for which the law came was to show people that it was impossible for them to be righteous on their own efforts or to save themselves even if they did the works of the law they couldn't sell this they had to bring those sacrifices on and on and they it, they couldn't remove the sins from their lives from their nature and the third reason for the law was to provide the people of israel and the jews uh, a way to life and bless and blessings until christ will come and we see that in deuteronomy 30 chapter 30 verses 15 to 20. let's read it together Uh, the lord says to moses and to the people see i have said before you today life and prosperity on the one hand and death and adversity in that i command you today to love the lord your god to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply and that the lord your god may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it but if your heart turns away and you will not obey but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them i declare to you today that you shall surely perish you will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the jordan to enter and possess it i call heaven and earth to witness against you today that i have said before you life and death the blessing and the curse so choose life in order that you may live you and your descendants by loving the lord your god by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him for this is your life and the length of your days that you may live in the land which the lord swore to your fathers to abraham isaac and jacob and to give them so here you see that the lord put in front of them life and death uh, blessing and curse but it depended was conditioned by their obedience to the law 
to the moral law. If they obeyed, they were blessed. They had, they had life. They were blessed. If they didn't, they had curse, they had death. And they had to bring those sacrifices to come back to a state of blessing. The law was a way for, for life and blessings to the people of God until Christ would come. And we also see that in Deuteronomy 28. It's a long chapter about blessings and curse. 28 verse 2 and 15. Let's read first Deuteronomy 28 verse 2. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. If you obey the Lord of God. The new creation has obeyed all the laws of God, has fulfilled all the conditions of God because Christ has fulfilled all the law. So for the new creation, there's no curse anymore, only blessings. And Deuteronomy 28, 15, But it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe, to do all His commandments and His statutes, with which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. So if they obeyed the law, they had blessings and life that would overtake them. If they didn't, curse would come over them. And that was the law provided a temporary way for people to experience life and blessings until Christ would come. And when Christ came, now we experience the new creation has only blessing, no curse, no death, only, only blessings and only the life of God because Christ has fulfilled all the conditions and you are in Christ. I am in Christ. Christ is in you. You are one with Christ. There's no more you. There's no more me. It's Christ who is perfect and he, was, he only has access to blessings and to life. And you and me, we are joint heir with Christ. We are heirs of God. And that's amazing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to Him. People were blessed either by obeying the moral law or by being atoned through the ceremonial law. We are blessed by being Christ and trusting in His grace and in His sacrifice. Romans 6, 17 to 18. Let's see something interesting here. Romans 6, 17 to 18. Paul says, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now, let me ask you something. When you were a slave of sin, have you ever struggled to sin? Have you, have you ever needed to exercise faith to sin? Of course not. You sinned naturally. Sin was something natural because you were a slave of sin. Now when you have become a slave of righteousness, why don't we believe that if much more, much more, God will work in us naturally by faith, His righteousness. And we don't need to struggle to be righteous. We don't need to struggle to have faith. We just simply trust in His righteousness in us, in His grace that works in us, that will produce naturally works of righteousness through us. In the same way, and much, much more, when we were slaves to sin, we didn't struggle to sin, but we sin naturally. Now when we become righteous, slaves of righteousness, we don't need to struggle to be righteous. Where righteousness will flow naturally through us if we trust and believe in His grace. Amen. If you notice, I only bring in this session passages and verses that talk about grace and what, about what God says and, and to bring more clarity and more understanding. And I hope you enjoyed and I hope it builds faith into you. So let's read a few more verses that talk about grace and what, what God is doing. Philippians 1 verse 6 says this, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Who began the work of the good work of salvation in you and me? God Himself. The, this verse says that He, God, who began the good work in you, the work of salvation, He is the one who will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus, the day of His return. So God is the one who started it, and God is the one who continues it and perfects it in you. It is by grace through faith. Well, let's move on to the next passage, Philippians. 2 verses 12 to 13. Let's read it together. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. 
you work out of your salvation through the fire of faith and by the renewal of mind. You don't work by do's and don'ts. You don't try, you don't address directly the works of righteousness. You, you work out of yourself by believing the right thing. And by, the Bible says here that God is the one at work in you. When you believe, when you create that channel for the grace to flow, God is at work in you both to desire, both to will, and the ability to work for His good pleasure. He gives you both the desire and the ability to work righteousness. He is the one that is working in you. Isn't that restful? Doesn't that give you rest and joy? That is, it's His ability. You just need to let it go and really believe that He, uh, he meant what He said. And He really works in you when you believe. And you don't need a big and extraordinary faith. You just need the faith of the, of the size of the grain of mustard seed to see the righteousness of God in you worked out every day. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 6 to 7. The Word of God is so wonderful and built into your faith, built into your righteousness. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So that neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. God is the one who causes your real growth in righteousness, in holiness, in the manifestation of His life uh, on outside. He is the one. You may water, you may, you may plant, somebody may plant into you and water the seed of God by faith, by renewal of the mind, but God... God is the one by His grace, by the Holy Spirit, is the one causes the growth, causing the growth. Praise God. Let's move on. Uh, we have two, three more, four more passages and we're done. Um, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 13. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, but for what it really is, the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. The Word of God which you receive and meditate is the one doing the work in you who believe. It is the Word of His grace. See, the Word is performing its work in you who believe. Just believe the word. And another place says the word of His grace. In Acts 20 verse 32 um, says, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among the saints, to give you the inheritance of God. So the word of grace is the one able to build you up and to give you the inheritance that God has put in you, in your new spirit, that God has given you the inheritance that we can enjoy while on this earth. What is this inheritance? Health, prosperity, holiness, wealth, um, victory, success, all the facets of spiritual life, eternal life, joy, peace, all the fruits of the Holy Spirit, peace, shalom, wholeness. The word of His grace is able to, to produce all those things. What the Bible says in Romans 5, I think that grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life. Grace produces life through the nature of righteousness. Where grace fuels the nature of righteousness. When we, when we, when we uh, uh, bring grace in contact with our the righteous nature that we receive by faith, grace fuels that righteousness and reigns and produces eternal life, produces life in our lives and in the lives around us, in our families, in our friends, produces the life of God. Amen. And one more verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 talks about sanctification, even more clear, clearer. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is doing the sanctification in this verse? May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. God himself sanctifies you. His grace is the one sanctifying you and the way you, uh, you activate that grace, the way you access that grace is by faith, by faith in His grace. And the last passage, and uh, here we'll give a few examples how to, uh, how to benefit from that grace, how to use your faith. So Romans 5.17 says this, 
For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So those who receive abundance of grace, if you receive, the more grace you receive, the more, the more you are reigning, the more you receive the gift of righteousness by faith. How do you receive this? The Greek word here, receive the abundance of grace is the Greek word lambano, which not, is not, it's not a passive receive, like somebody gives it to you and you're waiting to receive. It's an active receive, meaning you take, you receive into you by faith, you assimilate, you acknowledge, you become aware. That's the way you receive abundance of grace. You receive the gift of uh, righteousness. And how do you receive that? By faith and by confessing with your mouth before and during the temptation. So if you know that you have a, a weak area in your life, before you come into temptation or before you are again tempted to do the same thing, and also during, the, what you need to do is to believe that the grace, grace of the grace of God will save. The grace of God will make you, will cause you to walk in holiness in that area. I'll take a few examples. For instance, if you, if you struggle with gossip, right? And you say many times, you say, I cannot do it. I, I tried so many times to do it, but I cannot. I'm just tempted to do that. Now, when you receive this word of, of grace, this, this teaching, Take the moment and say, Father, I receive right now abundance of your grace in this area of gossip. And I confess that from this day forward, I trust in your grace that will make me get rid of this sinful habit. And from this day, I will not gossip and by your grace. And you don't think about it anymore. Just let the grace and confess the grace over that area. And then when you feel tempted to do that again, and if you even fall again, confess by your grace father thank you that your grace superabounds in this area and it makes me free and completely of this sinful uh, sinful habit or maybe you have a problem with exaggeration or lying the same thing i receive the abundance of grace in the era of lying and i will stop lying by the grace of god by the spirit of god i stop lying and i live in holiness maybe you have a problem with anger or bad words I receive, you, you confess with your mouth and you believe with your mind. And from that, after your confession, you start trusting that no matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances, the grace of God will help you, will cause you not to be ang to angry anymore, not to say those bad words. Or maybe you have a problem with drinking, smoking, drugs, the same thing. Or sexual immorality, lust, pornography, masturbation, the same thing. Uh, you, you declare and you say, Father, I receive the abundance of grace. I trust in your grace. I am under grace. And sin shall not be master of me, shall not have dominion over me because I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. The grace of God is my ability. And I, I am more than a conqueror. Greater is Christ that is in me than he that is in the world. I am born of God and I overcome the world by faith by faith and then you start ta talking and speaking in tongues and you build yourself in that area you build your faith in that area into your mind into your soul god uses that language that heavenly language to build into you and to create those processes in your subconscious in your mind in your spirit to cause you to uh, to to walk in freedom to walk in victory so i encourage you confess with your native language and then pray in tongues pray in tongues believing that the grace of god will do its work the same for depression anxiety rejection if you feel rejected if you have problem with depression anxiety ask the lord right now father lord jesus i receive your grace and your gift of righteousness into me in the era of depression anxiety jesus christ can never be depressed can never be anxious for nothing I am in Christ and Christ is in me. I receive grace in that area and I believe that from this day forward, I am free completely from depression, from anxiety, from, from um, rejection, from sexual immorality, from uh, drinking, from any addiction that you can name, any problem that you can name. I am free. And I declare myself free. And from this day forward, I walk in freedom. Praise the Lord. And when you pray like that, and then pray in tongues, you will see the victory of God. That's the only way, the same way you've been saved, the same way you, you, you live and walk in sanctification, in holiness. It's only by faith. It's not by your works. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. Today, today we covered the free 
three questions. Why do we still sin? What happens when we sin? How we are affected? And how do we walk in victory? I hope this message has been a blessing to you and built faith into you. And right now, before we end, let's pray together and let's bring this to the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Father, we thank you for your grace, for such a wonderful power. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness towards us. Thank you, Father, that you made it so easy for us to walk in holiness. Thank you for the victory that you have already given us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your ability, your grace, your power that works in us, your word of grace that works in us and perform its work in us when we believe it. Father, help us believe it consistently and keep keep it at, keep at it. Keep that way by praying, by a daily confessing and believing until Christ is fully formed in us, until Christ fully lives for us and we walk uh, in the full measure of the stature of Christ. Nothing less. We walk in your fullness because your fullness lives in us. We are complete in Christ. Your fullness dwells in us through Christ in bodily form. And Father, we want uh, as much as possible uh, all that fullness to then be manifested through us. That fragrance, that knowledge of your Son, that power. Father, I pray that you would empower us and that we would manifest your life, your joy uh, everywhere we go, through our words, through our attitudes, through our presence, Father. We pray that we permeate the atmosphere wherever we go. We permeate the atmosphere with the presence of the Holy Spirit, with the presence of your grace, and that we love people. Father, I pray that we, your love be manifested through us, the fruits of the Holy Spirit be manifested through us effortlessly and in rest. Father, I pray that you would keep us in rest and in faith and that you would help us by the Holy Spirit to never forget that our fight is the fight of faith and not fight with the devil, fight with the works. Father, we thank you and we worship you and we thank you, Jesus, and we, we thank, you, thank you, Holy Spirit, for your help in prayer and in, in this process of sanctification. Holy Spirit, we love you and we worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. May God bless you. And I look forward to the next session where we will talk about the gift of no condemnation forever and about uh, being justified forever and about the confessions of sin. Until we see again, may God bless you richly in every area of your life and enjoy, help you enjoy life and walk in peace, in rest, in joy every day. Amen.